Give the children a chance to join Deaconess Brown if they haven't already for Children's Church. And we'll continue on with the Word of God. Today is the uh, kickoff initial Sunday for our sixth worship service, which is downtown, a new opportunity we're uh, opening up. And so as we begin yet another opportunity to share Jesus Christ with people, across all of these services, we'll be talking about a new sermon series focusing on three words, called, connected, and community. We're going to start today by talking about being called by God, and we're going to focus on this text in 1 Corinthians 1, beginning at verse 4. And Paul writes to us, I always thank God for you, because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge. Because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. If I was to describe everybody sitting here today as a sailor, and you're sailing towards an unknown horizon, and you're going to sail through yet uncharted waters, what would you think? Now some of you might go, ooh, that sounds kind of adventurous, uh, sounds romantic, yeah, that's cool. Probably most of you are going to go, nah, Danny, I think you missed the mark today. Don't feel much like a sailor. Not really that adventuresome. Uh, not really uh, that kind of risk tolerance to sail out into the unknown, to go for a horizon that nobody's ever been there. Nobody knows what's there. And to get there through waters that are not charted. We don't know how shallow or how deep. We don't know where the reefs are. We don't know where the rocks are. And not, not, not really my thing. You kind of missed the mark today. But I'm going to stick with my analogy. Because every one of you, if I can use my analogy of sailing, every one of you is sailing into the next moment. You're sailing into the next 10 minutes, into the next hour. You're going to sail into this afternoon and tonight and next week and next month. And you have absolutely no idea what you'll encounter there. There will be things that will unfold in your life that will be awesome and incredible, that will be filled with celebration and joy, and you cannot even anticipate that in this moment. And there will be moments of sadness and sorrow and trial and tribulation, aggravation and frustration, questions and doubts, and you have no clue that that's going to unfold when it does. You just have to deal with it when you find it. Yet you sail forward, don't you? You step into that unknown future. You sail boldly uh, into tomorrow with no clue what's going to happen. Now you can enter into those unknown moments with bravery, with courage. You can be at peace. Uh, you can be faith-filled. Or you can be worried and anxious and afraid and doubtful. And obviously, God would want you to be the courageous and the brave and the faith-filled and at peace. And we would say the only way you do that is to sail those uncharted waters, to sail towards that unknown horizon, to sail into the moments of which you have no clue what's going to unfold, and sail on a ship called the Three Seas, called, connected, and community. Because when you understand that you're called and you're connected and you're in a community, it brings a whole new perspective on how you face life as it unfolds. So today we start with the word called. But think about that boat for a second. Because the early church used the boat as a symbol for itself. You know, in an ancient Roman world where Christianity was illegal, you didn't hang up a sign that said St. Paul's Lutheran Church services Saturday at 5, Sunday 8, 9, 30, and 11. You, you didn't do that. Because you might as well set up a sign to all the Roman soldiers and said, here we are, come get us. Because it was illegal, they would arrest you, put you on trial, and many of you, they would put to death. 
But believers wanted to know where could they assemble, where could they find other believers, but they had to do so in a secretive way, if you would. And so they would paint symbols on the side of their houses. And one of the symbols that they would put on the side of their house was that of a boat. Didn't have to be all that beautiful. You're walking down the street and you see a boat on the side of the house, you think, oh, the kid's been out there with a sidewalk chalk again. But when they put a boat there, they would know that's a Christian house and we can meet there with Christian people and pray and worship Jesus. The boat, however, was never a rowboat. Because a rowboat will go just as far and just as fast as your strength and your energy will carry it. And that's not the story of the gospel. It's not about you. It's not about your effort. It's not about your strength. It's not about your endurance. It's about Jesus Christ. So the boat that they would paint on the side of the house would always be a sailboat. Because it's the wind that drives a sailboat. And if you read your Bible enough, you know that the wind is often a picture of the Holy Spirit himself. And so the church will go just as far and just as fast as the Spirit of God drives her and leads her and guides her. So we are Spirit-filled, Spirit-led people. And the Spirit leads us into those uncharted waters. And the Spirit leads us towards that unknown horizon. And the Spirit comforts and calms and encourages us by helping us to remember we're called, we're connected, and we're in community. So we start with called. Let's get a biblical foundation for what it is to be called. We started with that 1 Corinthians passage. God, who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. God has called you to fellowship with His Son. That's the most important statement you're going to hear in your entire life. That God has called you into fellowship with himself. Fellowship's a Greek word, koinonia. And the Greek word means to take two things and to bond them together. Hence the word fellowship. Now this isn't marriage. In marriage, God takes two lives and makes them one. This is koinonia. God takes us and himself and he bonds us together. And Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that that bond cannot be broken by anything in all of creation. There is nothing that you will encounter in those unknown waters that can break that bond. God is with you. God is on your side. God is the one who has brought you to this moment, will carry you through this moment, and will strengthen, empower, and encourage you in this moment. He has called you into fellowship with his son. He has brought you and Jesus Christ together by washing away your sins, by his death on the cross, by rising again and conquering all that would separate you from God. We are now bonded with him. It's all about a relationship. Then Paul writes his second letter to young pastor Timothy and says, God who has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Again, not our efforts, but his. But he has called us to a holy life. The first and the primary call is to a relationship. The secondary call is to a responsibility. Don't ever confuse the two. Don't ever change the priority of those two. You are not first and foremost called by God to do something. You are first and foremost called by God to be something, his child. But we are called to do things. Now, when we think about a primary calling and we think about a secondary calling, we need to understand how they play themselves out in our life. But a primary calling is by God, and it's a call to God, and it's a call for God. It's about a relationship. You're called to someone. You're not called first to something, and you're not called first to somewhere. Now, we've been called to something, we've been called to somewhere, but not primarily. First, I am a child of God. First, He is my Father. And that's primary, and that's priority. Then, He gives me a calling to do something. In the church, we understand that. I, I, I'm a pastor, and as we understand it in the Lutheran church, the congregation 
God has used the congregation to call me to be the shepherd of the congregation. We get that. We understand that. God called me to do something. God has called me to be a husband. God has called me to be a father. God has called me to be a grandfather. God has called me to be a good neighbor. He's called me to all kinds of responsibilities. But those responsibilities have to flow out of who I am, out of this bond that we have together. If we confuse them, if we prioritize what we're supposed to do, then we see that God sent Jesus Christ into the world to be some kind of a divine recruiter. That Jesus Christ born in Bethlehem was to recruit workers for the kingdom of God. And rather than seeing him as our father, we see him as our supervisor. Rather than understanding this great loving relationship we have with the heavenly father, he's the boss who tells us what to do and when to do it and when to report for work. That is not the relationship that God wants to have with us. Jesus didn't come to be some kind of a heavenly headhunter looking for the right talented people to put into the right place in the kingdom. If we want to use an analogy for him, Jesus Christ came into the world to be an adoption agent. He came to find kids that were lost and homeless and bring them into the family of God. That's why again and again and again and again and again and again and again, Jesus wants us to understand that God who created everything is our Father. He's our Dad. How many of us grew up in a home with a family? I grew up in a home with a family, mom and dad, two older sisters. I never doubted. I may have been a little confused sometimes when I was getting a whooping. But I don't think there were moments when I doubted that my mom and dad loved me. I remember a time my dad worked three jobs. And there were times in a 24-hour time frame where I don't think he got any sleep because he was going from one job to another to another. But that's what he had to do to take care of us. He never hesitated. He did what love compelled him to do. My mom would sit down at times when mom and dad were struggling financially. My mom would put four pork chops onto the table, but there's five of us. All I was thinking about was, do I get one of those? My mom would always say something like, oh, I already ate. Go ahead, guys. I'm, I'm already full. I was so young and so selfish. All I thought about was myself. Not realizing she was going to go without food so we could eat. Never question that they love me. They always put that first and foremost in our relationship. Now, if you grew up in a family, did you have chores? You have things you were supposed to do? Yeah, we did. And you know, we didn't all have the same chores. I'm, I'm the only boy and I have two older sisters. So they had girly chores, you know. Uh, they helped mom cook and do dishes and laundry. And we manly men, dad and I, you know, we never did laundry. Well, my dad would say, you know, mow the lawn. That was a manly thing to do. Danny, mow the lawn. I don't think my two older sisters would know how to start a lawnmower. That's okay. See, they had their gifts, talents, and abilities and chores. I had my gifts, talents, and abilities and chores. God wants you to do this, and God wants you to do this, and God wants you to do this, and God wants you to do this. We don't all do the same thing. But in the family, we all have some responsibilities. In the family, we all have some chores to do so that the family is blessed by this opportunity. And we don't hesitate because we know how deeply we are loved. And the people asking us to mow the lawn are the same people who go to work three times, three different jobs in a 24-hour period. The same person who's asking us to do something when I'd rather be watching TV or playing with my friends or doing this or quite frankly maybe doing nothing. But the woman that's asking me is the woman who put four pork chops on the table and didn't eat that night. How will I respond to that? And the God who sent his son into this world to save me and to redeem me and to make me a child of God, to promise to love me, to cleanse me, to forgive me, that is the God who comes and says, Danny, I've got some things for you to do. Can you do them? But first is the call to God, to that relationship. And secondarily is the call to be responsible.
Let's look at Moses and see that example as it plays itself out. Moses is a shepherd. He's 80 years old. How, how many of us are willing to admit we're over 50? Come on, I can look at you and tell you're over 50. <laughs> how many of us are over 60? Come on. Long life, the Bible says, is a blessing. God has blessed you and give him some praise and honor in his house. How many of you are over 70? Okay, not, not too many in this service. A lot more in our earlier services. All right, Moses is 80 years old. Now, you got to put that in perspective. He's 80 years old. Last night, he and his wife met with their financial planners. And they realized that, you know, the money they had saved for retirement and their 401k was kind of running out. They didn't think they'd live this long after retirement. Uh, they're meeting with their financial planner to say, maybe we need some nursing home insurance. Uh, you know, we're getting a little old, you know, and back is kind of hurt. We may not be able to take care of each other too much longer. How are we going to handle They're dealing with all the things that 80-year-old people deal with. And one day he's out there, he's watching the sheep. And he looks up on a mountain and there's a bush that's on fire and it's burning, but it's not burning up. And he thinks, man, I've lived a long time, but I ain't never seen that. So he walks up the mountain and he discovers he's in the presence of God. He doesn't know this God. He has no clue that he's in holy ground. And so God has to say, hey, take off your shoes. You don't come into my presence with dirty feet like that. He doesn't know that. He's going to have to say to this God, I don't even know your name. We don't have any relationship. I don't know who you are. I don't even know your name. What am I supposed to call you? But before any of that happens, God says, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. What? Now put that in perspective. Everybody that's over 50, everybody's over 60, everybody's over 60, not that you young people, you know, wouldn't be just as baffled as we are, but, you know, we're thinking, uh, I'm thinking, I'm retiring in a little while. I'm going to settle down. I'm not thinking of great big adventures in my life. And God comes to me and says, Danny, uh, I need you to go to Iraq, and I want you to find the head of ISIS. And when you find him, I want you to tell him, stop this nonsense, stop all this murder, stop all this terror, stop all this violence. God does not want you to do that. How many of us are getting in that line? It's dangerous. I'm the next guy murdered on YouTube. Pharaoh is the most powerful man in the world, and he built that power on slave labor. If you take his slave labor away from him, his economy collapses. If his economy collapses, his power disappears. He's not going to let these people go. And he can snuff you out like that. So Moses is going, <laughs> uh, what? But that's his response. He says to God, who am I? Uh, we don't know each other. Uh, I don't know you, and I don't know that you know me. Uh, hi, I'm, I, I'm Moses. There's no relationship yet. And so when there's no relationship yet, the call doesn't make any sense. But let's back that up and say, sometimes the call that God gives to you doesn't make any sense. You're wondering why God has called you to this moment, this place, this time, this experience. You don't really want to be here. It's not all that pleasant. It's not all that wonderful. It's certainly not what you had planned for your life. And in your confusion, you're, you're reticent. You're saying, oh, I don't know. You're shrinking back. I, I, I know God. I don't, I don't want that. And so you don't accept that, you don't go there, you don't do that. You see, those moments in your life, it's not really about the secondary calling. It's not about the responsibility. It's not about what he's asking you to do. It's that you've lost your sense of your primary calling. You have forgotten who's talking to you. You have forgotten the God who surrendered his son to death for you. You have forgotten the horrors of three hours on a Friday afternoon when he suffered the damnation of every human being on the planet. And he did it for you. You see, the problem isn't the moment, the problem isn't the responsibility. The problem, like Moses, is you have forgotten the relationship, the bond. This is what we need to work on. This is why we dig deeper into the Word. This is why we come to the table. This is why we worship. This is why we do devotions. This is why we pray to strengthen this bond. Because when it breaks, when it gets a little distant, it isn't God who moved. It's you and me. 
we repent and we come back. Nothing can separate us from God, but you can walk away. And if you've walked away, then repent, turn around and come back. God would build a relationship with Moses and Moses would go and do the impossible. Let's look at the example of Isaiah. Isaiah is a completely different reality. Uh, Isaiah, God first comes to him and says, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Before God does anything with this man, he comes to him when he's in the temple one day and he takes a coal off the burning altar and he symbolically touches it to his lips and he says, I cleanse you, I forgive you. I want you to know my grace and my mercy. I want you to know and to experience and to receive my love. I want you to know how important you are to me. I want you to be my child. I love you, Isaiah. Then notice carefully, God says, speaking Trinity to Trinity, whom shall I send and who will go for us? He did not say, hey, Isaiah, I got something for you to do. He didn't go from primary calling to secondary calling. He just said, I love you, I forgive you, I'm reconciled with you, I'm your God, you're my children, this is awesome. Now, you know, we got some things we got to do. Who do you think we could get to go for us? Never did he say, hey, how about you? It's Isaiah who said, hey, how about me? Well, who's going to go? Here I am. Send me. Because that primary bond had been formed, he was willing to step up. Because God had forgiven him and saved him, redeemed him and claimed him, he stepped up. I'll, I'll, I'll go. And so he would serve God for a lifetime. At the end of a lifetime, he had no idea it was the end of a lifetime, but at the end of his life, he was arrested, tried, and executed. They executed him by sawing him in half with a saw, starting from his groin and moving up through his head. How do you deal with that? Boy, that was some uncharted waters there. That was a horizon he never saw coming. But he knew a God who said, in the horror and the hell of this moment, you are my son. I am your dad. And I'm here for you. And you and I are going to get through this. The bond was not broken, even in the hell. So there's going to be some rough waters and some rough sailing for us that lie ahead. There'll be some moments where God brings us. We don't really want to be there. We don't really want to experience that. That's going to unfold in everybody's life. There are going to be some waves so tall that you can't even see that unknown horizon anymore. And you are absolutely convinced they're just going to flow over you and overwhelm you. Peter understood that because Peter's the denier. Peter failed the one he loved the most when the one he loved the most needed him the most. And yet that one, Jesus Christ, came and forgave him and loved him and reconciled with him. He pulled him out of the muck and the mire of guilt and shame and failure. So in 1 Peter chapter 5, this same guy writes some words of encouragement to us. And in those words of encouragement, he starts by saying that God has called you. And only after speaking about the fact that God has called you, does he go on to talk about God will now rescue you. Yes, you are out there in the stormy, scary waters of life. Yes, it's not good. It's bad. It's scary. But God is with you because God has called you. The God of all grace who called you after you have suffered a little while, after the waves have crashed over the boat, after the lightning and the thunder, after all that has scared you and overwhelmed you, will himself restore you and God will make you strong, firm, and steadfast. But before the power, before the promises, he reminds you of the presence. God has called you. You belong to him. Don't be confused. God is not confused. You know, my, my name is Danny. It's not Daniel. Never has been, never will be. I am Danny. 
Every year when I went to school and went into a new classroom, the teacher would go, you know, down the rows and call the roll. And every year she would get to me and she would say, uh, your name is Daniel? And every year I'd say, no, it's Danny. And every year we had to go through that confusion. You know, when you're, you know, five years old and you got blonde hair and you're running around the neighborhood, you know, in, in 1950s and 60s and you were Danny, that was cool. Now you're 60 years old uh, and, you know, everybody wants to call you Daniel. No, not my name. Dan. No, not my name. It's Danny. Confuses a lot of people. But never God. Because in the waters of holy baptism, God came to Danny Wayne Tutwiler and said, You are mine. I wash you clean, little Danny. I make you my own. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will always forgive you. I will bring you home. There's lots of confusion, but not in his mind. There's lots of confusion, but not in his heart. He knows me by name. He knows you by name. And he has bonded with you, promising never to leave you, to forsake you, always to forgive you, always to be with you, to watch over, to protect and provide. There may be some rough waters ahead, but you will not face them alone. The God of all sovereign power is with you. The God of boundless love is with you. The God of immeasurable grace is with you. The God who holds all things in the palm of his hand is with you. And there is not an ounce of confusion in his heart about that. So in the midst of the rough seas and the high waves, and the brilliant lightning and the booming thunder. There's a God who whispers in your ear and in your heart, say along, say along. We're almost home. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, if I don't get anything at all out of being here in this moment, Help me to realize who I am. Just like little Taylor, who became a daughter of the living and true God, so am I. I'm a son of the true and the living God. I have a dad who loves me, who sacrifices for me, who calls me his own, who protects me, defends me, and provides for me. And no matter where I go, no matter what I do, no matter what happens to me, I am never alone because he has bonded with me his son Jesus Christ and I'm never alone let me grasp that hang on to that hold on to that until I get home in Jesus name Amen please rise